Now in here, do you guys have any issues with like um, tomato worms? Oh yes. Would you think um, probably about the same amount of issue as like someone with a home garden? Um, we possibly more. Really? Now why is that? I think because we don't have predators. We don't have birds and things in here. Now like how? You might in a home garden, although the hornworms are not a favorite food of any bird, but. But there is some amount of predation, and there's some that just even the weather affects the numbers. But I've actually, so there are other plants that are also in the solanaceous family besides the ones that we talked about. And so some of our native um, weeds and plants um, also can harbor um, hornworms. So it's not something that you plant tomatoes and and somebody's got a and, and a hornworm has to find your tomato patch. They're here th because there are other solanaceous weeds. So, and it's the same as a tobacco hornworm. So tobacco gets hornworm too. Um, so I've actually seen on a July day, I saw hornworms crawling across the driveway to get to this tomato tunnel. Now, can hornworms transfer diseases like from plant to plant? That's a question I don't know the answer to. They do so much disease that they do so so much damage to both the plant and to the fruit that um, they're just you know a pest that we're <laughs> that we're going to get rid of at, at any way we can and. So we come in here and we just pull them off, put them on the ground, squish them most of the time. But I have, um, I can't remember the name of her store, but the lady that owns the local uh, bird supply store, she collects hornworm and she come, sometimes comes over and scouts my plants to gather the hornworms because she sells them around the country because when a hornworm metamorphoses, it becomes a beautiful moth, similar to the sphinx moth. Sphinx moth. And so people collect the hornworms so that they can hatch the moths. So, Do you have any other like preventative measures or ways to get rid of them once they're in here? That's all we do is, is pick them and squash them. So you don't spray anything on the plants? Is there, is there anything an to... I'm organic farmer. Gotcha. And, and, um, most of the organic sprays are not very are not effective sprays, unfortunately. Um, that's the problem with being organic. Organic farmers still do spray, but they're limited as to what they can use, and most of the products that they can use are not very effective. I think that is something uh, the public doesn't realize either: is that the organic farmers still do spray. Is um, but they're just limited in the in what they can spray. And interestingly enough, some of the things that they can spray are more toxic than some of the things that farmers use. There's a thing going around the internet right now that um, that oh I'm I have my, these weeds and so I'm going to make a concoction of salt and vinegar and dish soap and many people don't realize that the LD50 which is the measure of toxicity of a chemical and so the higher the number the more it takes of a, of a chemical to harm an individual but the LD50 for salt is lower than the LD50 of Roundup so it takes less salt to kill you then Roundup. Salt will persist in the soil and kill other organisms in the soil, beneficial organisms that Roundup doesn't kill. And, and in many cases, um, while Roundup will reach down and travel through the vascular system of a plant and kill its roots, and then the, and then the Roundup has a half-life of like three or four days in contact with the soil so the roundup is inert after that where the salt's going to persist in the soil but it's not going to 
um, kill the roots of the plant so in many cases the weeds gonna come back again so um, all, all these stories on the internet they sound great but in practice um, they're they're not helping the person that, that wants to do good. So that practice that they're reading about on the internet, it's actually killing the biodiversity of an ecosystem then. That's a great way to put that, yes. And, and you can find, you, you can go to, uh, there's, a, there's a number of websites where you can go to, to verify what I just, what I just said. Um, usually, and of course there's all sorts of information on the internet, it's like going to the supermarket. You can just at the at the checkout line. There's a tabloid counter, and you can see babies with three heads and whatever, um, and ev everything, every kind of picture that you want to see about whatever celebrity. Um, and uh, but on the internet, whenever I do a, a search to to find out to find out if something is true or not, I I use uh, the uh, suffix on the end of my search string site colon dot edu and so when you put the suff the suffix site colon dot edu at the end of your search string you will only get websites that are associated with a university and so that's how I can verify when I find 99% of all the researchers at Michigan State University or U of M or Purdue or Rutgers when they all agree that uh, there is something uh, that is something is true then I have a tendency to believe that information over let's say a blogger or something a of blogger that or a for-profit company mm -hmm. um, or a, a well-meaning do-gooder that is just passing along what they heard or other studies that you can find that have not been peer-reviewed so you so you would suggest the public to look at their sources before they, before they come to a conclusion on, on something to see how credible their source is. Then. Absolutely. So there are websites that I've come to trust over time because I keep finding the veracity of their information. And so one of those is um, gmoanswers.com. So gmoanswers.com is one of the... Um, websites that I use or their Facebook page to find uh, and, and uh, dispute other information that I find on the internet.